Hello everyone and welcome back to GLB Productions. My name is Bruno Luce. Thanks for joining me. Now in this video, we're going to cover how to connect an active subwoofer to your sound reinforcement system. This is a video that has been requested many times by my subscribers and I'm very happy to be able to bring it to you now. Before we get on to the connections, let's first find out what we mean by subwoofer and what we mean by active. Now, before we can connect our active subwoofer, we need to understand what a subwoofer is. A subwoofer in the sound reinforcement context or live sound context is a speaker system that is designed to work in the sub-bass region of the audio spectrum. As you can see here on my whiteboard, I've got the sound spectrum laid out going from 20 hertz right through to 20 kilohertz. Now sound engineers will generally divide the spectrum into four broad areas. We have lows, low mid-range, high mid-range and highs. Now the exact point at which one transitions to the next is dependent on the particular instrument that you look at as well as the types of speaker systems that you're using. But in general, a subwoofer is a speaker system that is optimized to function in this area here, generally 100 hertz and below. Now, what about specific subwoofer models? In order to fulfill their role of operating in this sub-bass region, Subwoofers in sound reinforcement generally tend to have 15 or 18 inch speaker cones. Now what I have here is a 10 inch studio subwoofer and I'm using this just for illustration purposes. But in sound reinforcement, subwoofers tend to be 15 or 18 inch. There are some new designs that use a 2x10 or 2x12 configuration and they can sound excellent. There are also larger cones like 21 inch subwoofers that are used for speciality and certain forms of music such as reggae music, dub music, as well as electronic dance music. There are also some very large subwoofers that are used in cinema applications. But sound reinforcement, generally we're looking at 15 inch and 18 inch cones. The other thing about a subwoofer that sets it apart from a full range speaker, which I have here, is the fact that a subwoofer has only a single type of driver. As you can see here, it has only a 10 inch woofer. There are no mid range drivers and there are no high frequency drivers. If you compare it to this, the full range speaker, you can see that the full range speaker has a woofer and a tweeter. In larger sound reinforcement loudspeakers, they may have a mid-range driver in addition to this. And as a result, a subwoofer is a specialized loudspeaker designed to handle only bass and sub-bass. Now let's look at the word active. We hear the term active speakers, passive speakers. What's the difference between the two? All speakers need amplifiers. Whether a speaker is active or passive depends on where the amplifier is located. So on the left here, I have a passive speaker. This speaker requires an external amplifier and that amplifier is typically housed in a rack somewhere near the stage. If it's an installation, it may be housed in an amplifier room somewhere. But the point is this speaker will not function without an external amplifier. In the case of an active loudspeaker, the power amplifier is built into the back of the loudspeaker cabinet itself. There are several important differences between active and passive loudspeakers. To begin with, active loudspeakers such as these require at least two connections. They require an AC power connection and they require a line level signal connection. With a passive speaker like this, all that is needed is a single loudspeaker level connection. You can see that there are two connectors on the back, 
One of these is an input and the other one is a parallel output which is used for daisy chaining to other loudspeakers. In the case of our active loudspeakers, you can see they have an IEC receptacle which takes an IEC power cable, uh, also known as a jug plug in the UK, and they have XLR connectors for taking a line level signal from a mixing console. It's very important that you do not try and run the output of a power amplifier into an active loudspeaker because you will overload the input and you could very well damage the amplifier that is inside of this. Active speakers have a number of important advantages over passive, especially for mobile sound reinforcement use. To begin with, you don't need a separate amplifier rack. All you do is you bring the active loudspeaker, your mixing console, and whatever peripherals you need. That alone saves space and it also saves weight. With the new D-Class amplifiers, the digital switching amplifiers, an active loudspeaker can be made just slightly heavier than its passive equivalent. And that's really important for these days where fuel costs are going up, haulage and trucking charges are going up. So with, the, with an active system, you can actually get rid of quite a bit of gear and quite a bit of wiring. Secondly, active loudspeakers have the amplifier matched to that loudspeaker. So with a passive loudspeaker like this, very often it's you, the end user, who have to decide on what power amplifier works best and how much power do I need, how much power can I get away with, that sort of thing. With an active speaker system, all of that has been decided for you. The amount of power is just what the designer has determined that is right for that particular speaker system. There is also speaker protection in the form of limiters built in, which will hopefully stop your loudspeaker from blowing, although that is not guaranteed, especially if you overdrive the system. Finally, it's important to understand that an active speaker system will be more expensive than a passive speaker system. However, if you put in the costs of a separate power amplifier, as well as all of the cabling that is required to connect the amplifier to the loudspeaker, a active loudspeaker is almost always going to be cheaper than a passive loudspeaker and a separate amplifier. Now, do active loudspeakers have disadvantages? Yes, they definitely do. The biggest one is that you need to run both power and signaling to the speaker. This means that you need extra power cabling. It also means that you need additional power located near the stage. And sometimes you'll need power located on the stage itself. However, in my opinion, these trade-offs are worth it because active loudspeakers typically sound better than the equivalent passive system. Now let's have a brief discussion about whether you need a subwoofer. As you can see here, speakers come in two general types. They come in full range and subwoofers. You always need full range loudspeakers. Without full range loudspeakers, your system will be just bass. And while that may appeal to some of us, it generally does not result in a paycheck at the end of the show. So, when do you not need a subwoofer? I would say that if you do only the reinforcement of speech, for example, meetings, presentations, conferences, that sort of thing, you can generally get away with no subwoofer. So speech only, no subs necessary. This can be extended to light background music, where the music itself is not the main attraction. Classical music reinforcement can often be done with no subwoofer, and the reason for this is that classical music reinforcement is often at a slightly lower level than pop, rock, and that sort of thing. As well as the fact that classical music audiences often don't expect that sort of thunderous slamming sub bass that is associated with more contemporary types of music. So classical music reinforcement, often you don't need one, but check with the producer.
Now, if there is any kind of contemporary music, you need to look at whether you have instruments that operate below 100 hertz. For example, kick drum, floor tom, bass guitar, keyboard, and upright bass, just to name a few. If you have any of these instruments, I strongly recommend that you include a subwoofer in your PA system. Now, there are some exceptions to this, such as the club type PA system, where the PA system carries the vocals, keyboard, and acoustic guitar, and the other instruments, including the drums, are simply heard acoustically. So this will be applied on a case-by-case -case basis. In my opinion, any PA system sounds better with a subwoofer. And the reason for this is that you are spreading the load of the audio spectrum among more than one loudspeaker. When you're using just a full range speaker, that full range speaker has to handle everything. It has to do low, mid, and high. When you add a sub, the sub handles the low, freeing up the full range speaker to concentrate on the mids and highs. So it's like a team. As a result, the system sounds cleaner because there is more power available and it's much better able to handle transients. Things like kick drum, tom hits, snare drum hits, acoustic guitar, that sort of thing. All of that sounds much cleaner because the audio spectrum is being divided among these different loudspeakers. It's important to understand that the low frequencies contain the most energy. And because of this, it makes sense to have a separate dedicated speaker system for that part of the audio spectrum. Finally, with a subwoofer, you can actually reduce the size of your full range cabinets. If you have a subwoofer, you can often get away with using 12 or 10 inch full range cabinets because they don't have to carry the bass as well as the mids and the highs. So in my opinion, if you can afford it and you do contemporary music, it's always a good idea to have at least one subwoofer in your system. As my mentor and teacher, Marty McCann used to say, if you wanna mic the kick drum, if you wanna mic the bass guitar, you gotta have a sub, baby. Now let's look at the first method of hooking up an active subwoofer. And this is using the crossover that's built into the subwoofer. What we're assuming here is that we have an active sub and we also have active full range speakers, which are known as tops because they sit above the subwoofer, hence top, sub and top. So, what is a crossover? A crossover, which is also called an X-over, short form, is an electronic dividing network that splits a full range audio signal into a number of bands. And in the case of our example here, we have a sub band, which contains all the frequencies below 100 Hertz. And then we have a mid-high band, which contains all of the frequencies above 100 Hertz. Most active subwoofers nowadays have this built in. So the way that we're going to hook this up is from our mixer, we're going to come out left and right full range. We're going to go in to the active sub. The subwoofer crossover will divide the full range signal into lows and mid highs. The sub will handle the lows it will then output the mids and highs to our active top speakers. And this is how we're gonna set it up now. So here's the setup that we're gonna be using. I've got a Mackie 802 VLZ4 that is gonna act as our signal source. We have a small studio subwoofer and we have a full range loudspeaker again just for the purposes of illustration now before we go on we need to take a look at the back of this uh, subwoofer because this is the part that contains the crossover which we're going to connect to now in the case of this subwoofer you can see that it has a pair of inputs left and right it also has a pair of outputs now, on a lot of uh, sound reinforcement subs, you will have two pairs of outputs. You will have 
a full range output, which is basically just a parallel out and it's designed to connect to other subwoofers. And you will have a pair of high pass outs. And what this is, it's the full range signal minus the sub bass that the sub is handling. So basically the sub takes the full range signal, splits it up, takes the bass and it hands the mids and the highs off to our full range speakers. In addition to that, this particular sub has an input level control as well as the crossover frequency controls. Now on this sub, the crossover frequency is actually variable. You can see it's variable from 55 to 110 hertz. On many sound reinforcement subs, this frequency is fixed and it's typically fixed around 100, some maybe 120 hertz. And if it's fixed, don't worry, that's perfectly fine. It's what the system designers have said is appropriate for that particular subwoofer. To begin with, Let's hear how the system sounds with just the full range speaker hooked up. So we're coming out of the mixer and into our full range speaker. Sub is not connected. Now, for most people, they'd say that sounds pretty good. But if you listen carefully, you can hear that on the loud bass notes, the full range speaker is beginning to break up a little bit. And there are some, there's a little bit of distortion in the bass simply because it can't handle the level. And, you know, we're only at about 85 decibels here. You try and do that at 110 and see how your full range speakers sound. All right. Now let's get the sub hooked up. We're gonna come out of our mixer from the XLR outputs and we're gonna to connect to the left input of our subwoofer. If you have two speakers, left and right, you do both left and right. For this illustration, I'm only gonna do one side just because we've only got one full range speaker. After connecting the mixer to the subwoofer, you would take another normal microphone cable and connect the high pass output of the subwoofer to the full range speaker. Remember, make all of these connections with the power turned off. All right, now we're gonna set our crossover frequency. If your sub doesn't have a crossover adjustment control, you can skip this step. As I mentioned on this particular sub, the crossover frequency goes from 55 to 110. Because these are really small speakers, I'm gonna set it at 110. What that means is the sub will handle everything below 110 and the full range will handle everything above that. Okay, we're now ready to switch on. Mixer is already on. We switch on the sub first and then we switch on the full range speaker. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn the sub level all the way down so that we can hear the full range speaker without the sub. And what you hear is that it now sounds a lot less bassy. So the reason that it sounds real thin now is that the sub has taken away all of the low frequencies. Now you wouldn't want to leave your system like that because it sounds terrible, doesn't it? So this is where we bring in the subwoofer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the input sensitivity of the subwoofer. This particular sub has a detent at the 12 o'clock position because that's sort of nominal, right? Same in, same out. 
I already set the level of the full range speaker to the volume that I want. The sub has a polarity switch. I have it pushed in just because the sub is facing one way and the full range is facing the other way. I face the full range towards the camera so that you can hear the full range as opposed to the muffled sound with it facing away. All right, now let's hear the same track which I recorded by the way. Enough said. Now I don't know if you could hear there, but when I turn the sub up past the uh, unity gain setting, the room actually started vibrating and that's what the subs do. So now we have to ask ourselves, how do you match the level of the sub to the level of the full range speakers? If this were a professional setup, what we would do is we would use something like Smart Live to optimize the system. But if you don't have Smart Live, you can use a spectrum analyzer or you can just use your ears. Start with the sub at the unity gain position, right? If there's a zero on the back, if there's a detent 12 o'clock position, set it to that. Then play a track that you know well and listen. If there's not enough bass, turn up a bit. If there's too much bass, turn it down. But of course, there's never <laughs> too much bass. But seriously, if you find that the balance is wrong, don't be afraid to turn the sub down because every venue has its own acoustic. Some venues are naturally very bassy. This is especially true if you have the sub in a corner or if you have the sub next to a wall. So sometimes you actually have to bring the sub level down. If you are outdoors, the opposite is true. Without these reflecting surfaces, you need a lot more sub bass to have the same effect as when you're indoors. So use your ears and don't be afraid to make adjustments. So now we're going to look at the second method, which is the group or ox fed sub system. Now this is a little bit more complex than the first, but it gives a lot more control and is favored by many professional engineers, myself included. So what we have in this situation is the mixer is connected through a high pass filter to the top or full range speakers. Now, how you get this high pass filter can be done in a number of ways. You can use an analog crossover to provide this and not connect the low output to anything. You can use a system processor or there are a number of full range speakers available today that have a subwoofer mode. And what that does is it inserts a high pass filter after the input to the speaker, which basically takes away the bass because it knows that there's a sub somewhere else handling it. Then a post fade aux send or a group send is connected to the subwoofer. Now the advantage of this system is that it allows you to send only specific channels to the subwoofer. And this has a number of advantages. Number one, it reduces the load on the sub amp because you're only sending the channels that you choose to that subwoofer aux send. Good choices are of course kick drum and bass guitar, as well as floor tom and certain keyboard patches. The other thing is that this technique can actually reduce feedback because you're not sending the vocal mics to the subwoofer and typically the subwoofer is on the floor or ground nearer the, uh, the singers than would be a flown or pole mounted full range speaker system. It is best to choose an aux send as long as it's post fade and the reason for that is that the level of the sub will track with your fader movements. But if your post fade aux sends are all used typically for effect sends, you can also use a group send or a matrix send that you have configured specifically 
for that purpose. All right, now let's hook up our OxFed subwoofer. What we have here is we have the same setup. Our mixer is connected directly to our full range speaker. Now, in reality, this connection would have to run through either an external crossover or some kind of digital processor, or if your active uh, full range speaker has a sub mode, you need to engage that. Now, let's connect the sub. To connect the sub, I'm gonna use a TRS to XLR male cable. You can also use an adapter. And because this particular mixer has only a single aux end, we're gonna to connect to that. We're gonna make sure that the aux end is set to post, and I'm gonna connect this to the subwoofer. Subwoofer settings are the same, and we're gonna power the system on, sub first, and then full range. And I'm gonna play that track, and as we play the track, I'm gonna turn up the aux end on the channel where my recorder is connected. So at first you'll hear no sub, and then you'll hear more sub. Level on the sub is set to unity. No sub. Turning up. There's the sub. More sub. Back to no sub. So that's how you implement the Oxfed subwoofer technique. Now what about if you have passive full range speakers, meaning that you have an amplifier and loudspeakers. This is the case with many existing systems out there. And people want to add a subwoofer to a system like this. The good news is that it's really easy and you don't necessarily need an external crossover. This is how you do it. From your mixer, you take your left and right connections, which would normally go to your system amplifier and you connect them to your active sub. You then connect the mid-high or high-pass outputs from the sub to your amplifier in exactly the same way as you used to connect your mixer outputs. So the sub sits in between your mixer and your amplifier, and all of the frequency dividing will happen as we've shown in our instructions, and you'll have a subwoofer. If you want to use the aux fed technique with full range passive speakers, you will generally need to add some kind of filtering before your front of house amplifier to cut the bass out of your full range speakers. And this can sometimes be a crossover. It can also sometimes be integrated into the power amplifier. Many power amplifiers these days have a built-in crossover or filtering function which can be used very, very successfully with an additional powered subwoofer. And finally, a word about larger PA systems. With larger PA or sound reinforcement systems, most of these functions will be handled by an external digital signal processor, DSP, or electronic crossover. Um, your mixer would be connected to the DSP, the DSP would do the frequency division, and then you would have full range and subwoofer systems. These methods that I've shown you today, by and large, do not require the connection of an electronic crossover because the crossover in the sub is more than sufficient for small PA systems, and that's how they are designed. So unless you have a larger system, you often do not need a separate crossover if you have an active sub. So that's how you connect an active subwoofer to a sound reinforcement system. I hope this video has been useful. As you can see, there are a number of different ways to connect an active sub to your sound reinforcement system. There's inline, there's group fed or aux fed, and you can also use an external processor or crossover. 
If you have any questions, and I'm sure you do, or comments, please feel free to leave them below. I love to hear from my viewers, and I'm more than happy to answer questions on this topic. So until the next video, this is Bruno Luce for GLB Productions. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.